Well, hello, church. I was about to say it was good to see you, but I can't see you. So I'm just going to say it's good to be with you. And hopefully you'll be watching this um, on Easter Sunday. It's our Easter Sunday message. Um, I like to call it Resurrection Day. And I hope it finds you doing well. I hope it finds you making the best of the situation that we're in. Um, and again, it's just, it's tough to not be with you, to have you here in the house as we, we celebrate this. And I know with God in our midst, we can celebrate it together. By one spirit, we're still joined. Um, and yet I know that physically we're at a distance and it's a difficult time for that. I haven't heard from any of you lately. I understand you're probably really busy or maybe not. Um, so don't feel, uh, feel free to drop me a, an email or a text or something to let me know how you're doing. So tonight we, uh, or tomorrow morning, if, the, if that's when you watch this, we're, we're going to be speaking about this day, this great day. And, and it really is a tragedy in a sense that, that this has happened to our country. And so many of our brethren and, and sisters are just not able to be together this day. We just had kind of a robust discussion about that um, before church began. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you as we come into your presence, Lord, and Lord, we come to this day, Lord, that is totally about you. And Lord, if we know the truth and, and our mind is set right, Lord, every day should be about you. But Lord, this celebration, the one that speaks of your resurrection, it comes about but once a year. And Lord, what a special time it is for us to pause to consider that great work, a work that we can't even explain, Lord. It's so far beyond our understanding, but yet it captures our imaginations, Lord, and it speaks to us in volumes about your power, the length that you went to, Lord, to save us. And so, Lord, as we consider that today, Lord, I pray that we would see beyond the gift, Lord, that this day represents, but I pray we would see and we would understand, Lord, we'd have a glimpse of the application of the power that was displayed this day for each of us as believers. Lord, I pray you would set that truth in our heart, and I pray that it would guide us from this day forward. And so we yield to your purposes today, Lord. We ask that your spirit would move in our midst, bind us together by your spirit, Lord, no matter the distance or what is between us. And Lord, shine a light on your word as we consider Lord, what only you could do, only what you did, and Lord, all that it means. And we thank you in advance and we praise you, Lord. We give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As I kind of alluded to in my prayer, I just wanted us to think today as we consider the resurrection story as we think about all the imagery that goes along with that, all that we've been taught, many of you probably from Sunday school forward. I want us to think beyond probably the first thing that comes to our minds when we consider Resurrection Day. And usually the first thing that comes to our minds when we say what was it all about is the words, the forgiveness of sins. And I think I would join with you in saying that if that was all it was about, then that would have been enough. It would have been in plenty, and it was way beyond anything that we deserved. And it is about that. It is about the blood that was shed. It is about the forgiveness that was granted because of the work that Jesus did. But I want us to see that it didn't stop with that. Sometimes I think with Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, however you might call it, we think an awful lot about what Jesus did, and we should, because in a sense, it's all about what he did. But I think today, what the Lord would have us consider is what did it do for us? And if it did even more than forgive our sins, are we taking advantage of that? Are we doing the most with that that we can? I think that's what we have to have as a question before us this morning. I don't think we consider can consider the resurrection without considering where does that fit? And I don't think we can talk, answer that question of where it fits without answering a very simple question, is what is the gospel message? What is that gospel that we're to take into all the corners of the world? 
Well, Paul speaks to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And I hope you grabbed your Bibles. If not, go get it. But beginning in verse 1 of chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel message in its simplest form, Paul presents here as, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what did the burial and resurrection of Jesus accomplish for us? Now I answered a bit of that a moment ago. It forgave our sins. But I want us to see beyond just that picture. I want us to see beyond that truth. Because I think beyond that truth comes an answer to what are we to do with that gift. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ means you accepted that gift that Jesus earned for us. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So who is in Christ? Those that have accepted that work that he did on the cross and then from the grave in his resurrection. Everyone that calls on him as Lord and Savior proclaims that by mouth. Those are in Christ. And for those of us that claim that, it tells us because of what he did, because he rose from that grave, because the tomb is empty, because he beat death, we're a new creation. Now that can seem very cliche. Well, of course I'm new. I'm saved after all. But it says that we're new. That means we're no longer old. We're not the old things, it tells us. It tells us that the old things about us have passed away, which means that if those old things still exist in our lives as believers, we've drugged them along. Or we once left them and we've drugged them back up. Those things have passed away. It's been guaranteed. It's been promised. It's the result of what we come to celebrate today. And then it ends that verse by saying, Behold. It's kind of the word that stops us. And we start to look for what is coming. And it tells us then, behold, all things have become new. If you go into the definition of that word, all things in the Greek, it's huge. And I'm going to tell you just the simplest way I can. It leaves nothing out. When it says all things, there's nothing left out. All things about you and I who believe are no longer old. Now the Bible is clear. We wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with our own flesh and blood. We wrestle with the old man, the old woman, what we're told. But I believe most of that's by choice. Most of that's because we haven't seized the truth that's here and put away those things that would qualify as old. Because often we don't see that we have the power over that. All things have become new. And I often say when I teach this verse, because I believe it, that the day of our salvation that we were changed both physically and spiritually. We're no longer spiritually dead, we're alive. And I believe things physically changed about us down to the most minute level. It's what we do with that going forward that counts. Now praise God that Jesus didn't die for the forgiveness of our sins and then leave us the same. If Jesus had done that, he would have taken the punishment we deserve but our hearts and our lives would have remained the same. But he doesn't simply forgive us without changing us. Those that believe on him as Lord and Savior are no longer bound to sin, no longer slaves to sin. Also, Jesus' resurrection provides those who believe in him the hope of a secure future. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, Jesus, speaking to the woman at the well, 
He says to her, whoever drinks this water, pointing into the well, I'm sure, he says will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's another change that he has for us. That we might die physically, but we would live on spiritually with him. Everlasting life. Never ending life. Eternal life. You know, to truly appreciate all that, we need to remember that we were all once dead in sin. You know, none of us want to look back at our old lives necessarily. No, we get in trouble sometimes by telling tales of the old life because sometimes it still seems unfortunately exciting. We have to stop ourselves and say, no, that was my old life when I lived in sin. But we were all dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins at one time. Now, what I want you to do to make the rest of this study a little bit easier, I want you to do a couple things with your Bible before we carry on. First, I want you to go find the book of Acts. Find the book of Acts right after the Gospels. And when you find the book of Acts, which is actually should be called the Acts of the Apostles, I want you to find the 16th chapter. 16th chapter of the book of Acts. And when you find the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, I want you to put your finger there, and I want you to turn one book to the right, to Romans, and find chapter 8. So with the finger in Acts 16, I want you to find chapter 8 of Romans, one book to your right, find chapter 8. So we're going to spend some time in Romans 8, and then eventually we'll go back to Acts, but that way you'll know where it's at when the time comes. Now, we could spend the rest of this year <laughs> speaking about this chapter. We're going to look at a bit of it as it applies for us today. I'm going to begin with you in verse 5 of this chapter. But what I've done is I've taken verses 5 through 9, and I've only talked about the negatives that are listed there. All the things that really account for those days when we lived in the flesh. And again, I say we need to remember those so that we can truly appreciate the difference now. And so if I look at verses 5 through 9 of Romans chapter 8, the negatives there, the things about living in the flesh are these. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. To be carnally minded is death. Carnally means fleshly. To be fleshly minded is death. There in verse 7, it says, The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can be. The carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is at war with God. We're told other, other places in Scripture that not only are we at enmity with God, that we were enmity. We were the warfare itself with God before salvation. In verse 8, it says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In verse 9, it says, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And so we need to remember that's where we came from. That's where we were before the gift that Christ earned for us on this day, resurrection day. But then look again at those verses. I'm just going to cover verses 5, 6, and 9. And look that through the resurrection of Christ, we now have this rebirth. And look how Paul describes it here. Verse 5, but those who live according to the Spirit basically set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And verse 6, and to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And verse 9, if you're not in the flesh but in the Spirit, indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so there's this huge contrast that I wanted to show you there in those verses between what it was to be in the flesh, what it is now accepting the free gift of salvation that Jesus earned for us, the freedom that one describes, the slavery that the other puts forth. 
Now, when we consider the resurrection, how do we even relate to a power that can raise a person from the dead? Because that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And how do we as mere mortals, those that could never have done that on their own, how can we relate to that power that we're speaking about here? Well, that same chapter that we're in, Romans 8, pick up with me in verse 10. And it says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so we notice in verse 10 and verse 11, there's two occurrences of the word if. So it's conditional. If these things are true, then. So if Christ is in you, well, only you can answer that. Is Christ in you? Have you given yourself to him fully? Is he your Lord and Savior? If true, then he is in you. And your body is dead to the sin that it had, but now you have the spirit of life in you and the covering of Jesus' righteousness. And then in verse 11, the other condition, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and I can answer that for you if you're born again today, then the answer is yes. Because once you're saved, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, to indwell you. So if that be true, then you're also then given life in your mortal bodies through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So with that now on our minds, what's our response to the Spirit? The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and now lives in us who believe. Put another way, how shall we now live because of this? Well, we continue on, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So how shall we now live? Well, first we're told that we're debtors. We're debtors not to the things of the flesh of the world. We're debtors in spirit to the things that the Lord achieved on our behalf. We're told that if we are to conduct ourselves correctly with all these truths now in mind, we're to put to death the deeds of the body. We're not to drag up the old man, the old woman anymore. We're to recognize if we have and we're to put those things away. We're to be led by the Spirit, we're told there in verse 14, and that can only come if we're not being led of the flesh. And then verse 15 speaks about something that can go past our modern minds, modern minds, that we receive the spirit of adoption. Adoption in the days of Christ was something even beyond what we have these days. In those days, for someone to be adopted, they were given almost more credit than the, 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 the son or daughter that was born to the parents biologically. There was something so special about the adopted child. And in the context of what we're speaking here, we're adopted into the family of God. And then it goes on, it's so humbling to hear that we're heirs of God. We're heirs with Christ. We stand as sons and daughters in the family of God with Christ. But then in verse 17, we get another conditional if. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, the point of that last verse, verse 17, it's often ignored because it's uncomfortable. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So the question comes, how do we make that work for us? How do we process the thinking that says our sufferings are a thing by which we will be glorified together with Christ? 
Listen to the Apostle Paul process this thinking. In Romans 8 again, verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So, how does Paul process this? That he would have to suffer and somehow he would be glorified with Christ in that? He can only come to a pattern of thinking that makes that possible when he looks ahead of the times he's in into the life beyond. And he realizes there that the glory that will be had so outshines the sufferings we have today that it makes what we suffer today okay or null and void, something we don't have to consider. And so I would think in that he would say, I don't concentrate on what I'm facing today. I look beyond it to the reward that will come because I face it today, because I move through it today. You know, Paul demonstrated, just like Jesus, that to live is to die, and to die is to live. That way of life is the resurrected life. And I think that's what we're to take today from this. We're to be thankful, we're to praise God for the forgiveness of sins that was accomplished by the cross and by the empty tomb. But I think what he's trying to tell us today, especially in these times, is that we need to be moving in our entire being in the resurrected life. Because we share with him, we're told, both in his death and in his life. Now we struggle with the death, putting the old man away, but sometimes I think we totally forego the other, living in the resurrected life, living with the power that indwells us that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, as we've read, that is a power we should know but only if we also know the one who bore our sins and gave us eternal life. Now that word know can go by so easily in the English English language. We need to know him. That needs to be a desire of our heart and we should never wake up a single day between now and the end of this life without wanting to know him more. Because I have to believe that he would not have left us here another day if we weren't to learn something more about him. And as I often say, I believe it's why we're given eternity to live. Because I think we will discover more about him, well, forever. Forever. So we are to want to know him. We're to get to know him. We're to be purposeful about that desire in our heart. Now the Apostle Paul provides wisdom on how we can know this power. And for that, I take us to Philippians And it's just one verse I'm going to share, so you don't have to do any acrobatics to find it. But Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul writes there, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. So in that verse, Paul says, That I may know. And so Paul uses those words to express his deep, passionate desire to know the Lord and that's what it needs to be for us it needs to be passionate it needs to be deep our desire to know him now those words in that verse are connected to three other words to know him to know power and to know fellowship now I'm going to take those out of order but I want to hit each one of those knowing him where we've started You know, a life raised from the dead should exhibit an intense desire for personal, and I'd say experiential, knowledge of the person that has given you that life. I mean, if you received an amazing, you can fill in whatever it might be, an amazing gift in the mail. I mean, just something that just made you feel so humble and privileged that you would receive that from someone and yet no return address. I mean, that would drive me crazy to not know who it was sent by. Was it sent to me even on purpose? Maybe it's an accident. I mean, I would would spin for a while trying to figure that out. And then if I knew, if I came to know who did that, I I mean, it would be my desire to thank them, to, to wonder why you would even have sent me that. Or maybe I'd have been so humbled I'd have tried to give it, to give it back. And when I think that Jesus gave us something 
that we can't even describe. That he gave us the forgiveness of sins. That he gave us eternal life. That he gave us this resurrection power. Don't you want to get to know him? The one who gave you that? Don't you want to know him a little bit more? And yet we may ask questions we shouldn't even ask. Like, why me, Lord? I mean, you gave that to me, Lord. And sometimes we, we say to ourselves, you know, even if it was just me, he'd have died. And then sometimes I wonder if there's an echo in our head that says, really, would he have? Don't ever let the devil get there with a question like that. Because yes, he would have. But don't you want to get to know him more? That's what Paul's speaking about here. And then a little bit out of order, the next one I'm going to cover is knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. This is the one we'd all like to skip. Paul sees suffering for the sake of Jesus as a high calling. He sees it as a privilege. Christians are alive in Jesus and therefore should be dead to the things of the world. Paul wants to have full fellowship with the Lord, including his sufferings. See, if you want all of Jesus, you're going to get all of what he has endured. If you want the full life of Jesus living through you such that you represent him, then you're going to get a little bit of what he got. Jesus tells us that we'll have tribulations in this life. When our lives reflect him, we will share in his sufferings. And then the last one that I wanted to cover, knowing the power of his resurrection, which really just resonates with where I think the Lord has us today. You know, the power of Jesus' resurrection gives us hope, hope in a new life. Colossians 3.1 tells us that this power raises us up with Jesus. Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 6 tells us that through this power we're made alive. And Romans 6.4 tells us that we are raised to live in a new way because of this power. So I don't think you can really go through that without asking the question, do we truly know him and his power? I think it's possible to know him and never know his power, not fully. But even if you know him and don't know his power fully, I would have to question if you know him fully. I think they go hand in hand. I think the more we know about him, the more we experience that power in our lives because we've drawn closer and he indwells us even full, more fully. Listen, I believe this season that we're in right now is full of opportunity. And I know that's, you may be thinking to yourself, you know, don't, don't puff me up about what we're going through. Don't try to make me feel better. Well, fine. I'm not trying to make you feel better. But I'm trying to tell you the truth. And the truth is right now, I think we have incredible opportunity, even if we don't recognize it. You know, and the opportunity is this, and I'm gonna use a phrase that you may not be familiar with. It's an old one. The opportunity is to prove our mettle. Prove our metal, M-E-T-T-L-E. Now, proving one's metal is not something that we hear in our language very often, but what's the definition for that, that phrase, prove our metal? It means to prove that one has endurance and strength of character or the necessity or the necessary skills, abilities, or traits to succeed in something. That's proving one's metal. Now, the truth is, the medal that is required right now is a medal that we do not have. So why would I tell you to prove your medal if it's something you don't have? Well, Jesus does have it, and he's already proven it. Listen, if we want to give Jesus the greatest respect and honor for the work he worked for us, then we need to live a life of resurrection power, the power that he purchased and then placed in us. We need to embrace him and his power and thereby endure the fellowship of his sufferings. And so we may not be able to prove our mettle, but if we live rightly and closely to him and in the spirit, then we will prove his mettle. That's what will be proven. And after all, isn't that what our lives are to be about? So what a great opportunity in a time as challenging as this, as confusing as this, as weird and strange as this, is there to let 
him shine forth. To let his metal be proven. Now hopefully your fingers in the same place. Let's turn to the book of Acts. Now I believe the Lord has a story here in this chapter for us to consider as application. Application of the life of Jesus and what life Jesus has for him in us in this season of life, what we're facing right now. So let's begin in verse 16, a story that most of you are familiar with. I'm going to comment on the verses as I go through. Verse 16 says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Here's what I want you to know in that verse. When we go to prayer, the world and our enemy shows up. When we move to do any ministry in the name of Jesus, the world system and the enemy shows up. Earthly powers and evil spirits often become active in the presence of God's people. That's what we're seeing here. Because we're targets of the enemy because of who lives in us. Keep that in mind as we go through this story. Verse 17. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, you need to face it. When you're the only person in the crowd with a hat, you're going to be easy to find. And why do I say that? Because as a believer, you wear a spiritual name tag that reads, Child of the Most High God. And so you're going to be noticed, especially if you're moving in the ways of the Spirit and doing the ministries that he's called you to do. You will be noticed. The enemy will notice you, and they'll even know what you're doing. Look at verse 18. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. Now, by the power of the Spirit that lives in us, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, we have authority over the dark forces of the enemy. And that's something you just need to accept. You just need to believe that and be willing to walk in that. And I think too many believers don't believe that. They think it's for somebody else. And it's not true. He lives in each of us not just some of us. Look at verse 19. And when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly work, ex- excuse me, exceedingly trouble, trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. Now, we kind of see an example of that of the sufferings that Paul was talking about. We would experience the sufferings of Christ. And more to the point, Jesus himself says in John 15, beginning in verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, the presence of the Lord in his people on earth is a hindrance to the fullness of evil running rampant, going to the extent that it wants to. I believe that. They sense this fact, and the world system resents us for it. And I believe why this is so important for us to see now is that's why, in a sense, and you may not see it as such, but in a sense, the church today is being singled out. Speaking to brothers and sisters just before this message started to come forth. We were discussing this very thing. Have you heard of any other group, any other group of people, any other type of organization, other than maybe small businesses, but yet even that is different, that are being challenged in this time from meeting? I don't know if others are meeting. 
I think about all the social clubs. I think about all the types of meeting. I think about other religions. And I don't know if they're meeting because no one's talking about it. But you know who they're talking about. They're talking about the people of the living God. They're talking about the followers of Jesus Christ. They're talking about churches. And what they've stepped on amongst all the other things in the First Amendment is the freedom to assemble and the freedom to worship. And it seems to be all about us. But we shouldn't be surprised. As a matter of fact, it should be a badge of honor. But we also need to review how we're responding to it. But we're a hindrance to the fullness of evil going forth. We see that in the fact that when we're removed, that all hell will break forth on earth. And yet now, there's something that curbs it. They sense it, whether they can point to it or not. They're working against us because of that, whether they understand what they're working against or not. We are a problem for them, and to, for that I say, praise God. Look at verse 22. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, these verses, those three that I just read, they mark where our personal choices in what we truly believe begin to matter most. Ask yourself, do you believe that we who are free in Christ can be enslaved again? The answer is no. Those that are free in Christ, we're told in Scripture, are free indeed. But the world system is a prison. Maybe you've never looked at it that way before. But the world system is a prison. It has always been one that has sought control. You go through the kingdoms of the world and all the histories, and it was always to control the people. Someone up high controlling someone down low all under the influence of the one who wants to control the whole world and heaven itself, and that is Satan. The world system is a prison, and its inhabitants are all prisoners. That means that the only ones that can lose are those that are truly free and are somehow led to forget that truth. This week, we remember and celebrate the reality that Jesus faced down Satan and his kingdom. In doing so, Jesus acknowledged the reality of evil, the men who worshipped it, and those that were controlled by it. Jesus engaged the powers of hell because they control the kingdoms of the world. Kingdoms that will all someday turn to Jesus through confessing tongues and bent knees. With this in mind, I have to ask, why then is the church so reluctant and often cowardly? Why doesn't the church admit those powers over the earth and man? Why don't they admit those powers exist and then respond appropriately? And what is the appropriate response? Well, first believe. Believe in the power that we're talking about today. Believe that evil does exist and it controls the unbelieving world. Then walk in the resurrection power that the Holy Spirit grants us. Then, from 1 John chapter 5, know that we are of God. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And I'm going to tell you, not believing that is not an option. If we're surprised by what we see in these days, if we're surprised by the decisions of government and men, then we do not believe that verse that I just read, that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And I'm gonna tell you, if you don't believe that's true, one, you're standing totally in direct opposition to scripture, and you're really questioning why Jesus would have ever went to the cross and beat death in the tomb. Then, 
study. Study to truly understand what Paul is teaching in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It's a verse I share often because it's something we need to face often. And these times are no exception. Matter of fact, I believe it's the reason we need to know this verse so well. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Understand that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Brothers and sisters, that is a hierarchical chain of command, military organization that is doing everything it can to enslave man and destroy the church. And if they can enslave mankind and they can come against the church so that faith fails and falters, then there's going to be a whole lot of people in those prisons that were once free in Christ because they didn't believe in totality, that it was all true. They never walked in it. They never tasted how good it was. We need to be those that will not be challenged in these days, that we will not faint. We will not falter. We will not fade away. We need to understand that this is real. It's not those faces, those talking heads on the news. It's not everyone that's standing around President Trump when he has his press conference. It's about the spirits behind so many of them. Those are the ones that are controlling things now. Believe it or not. Understand that Paul is teaching us this so that we accept the urgency to put on the whole armor of God. Then with understanding and being properly equipped, we're to enter into that life of prayer and the conduct of a believer in the face of the trials and the tribulations that we face. Let's continue now there in verse 25 of chapter 16. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Listen. God gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of, joy, oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If there's one thing we should be doing now is we should be singing out in praise so that those that are in darkness, those that are imprisoned, would know that there's a God in heaven and one that is worthy of our worship even in the times that the world now sees is so confusing and so tough. I don't know if you've seen these reports, but there's a movement out there right now. Strong opinion, but I'm going to share it. It disgusts me. There's a movement out there right now. It started, I believe, in Colorado. It has spread to many different areas of the country, many different cities. Began, I think, as something promoted on Facebook, no surprise. But people in different locations across our country are coming together at the doors of their house, outside the windows of their house, maybe some of them brave enough to step outside their house, at 8 p.m. at night to howl. That's right, I said howl, H-O-W-L. They're howling, somehow believing this is a show of solidarity, that they're standing strong in the face of the world by howling like animals. I'm disgusted that that somehow that we would act like the very animals that we're becoming, caged in our zoos, and then we would respond in kind and think that's a sign of strength. Brothers and sisters, we're not to be people that howl, we're to be people that worship. Look at verse 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains loosed. My favorite part of the story. You know, it really responds and coordinates very well with something that the author of the book of Hebrews gave us in chapter 12 of that book, 
I'm going to read those verses, Hebrews 12, 25 through 8. It tells us there, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. Speaking of God. For if they, he's talking about the Jewish forefathers, did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, but much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. Remember Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. But now he is promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as if things were that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Here's the lesson. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. We are a people that are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And if that be true, then we are a people that cannot be shaken. So we cannot ignore, like the Jewish forefathers, the one who speaks from heaven. Because we're told that he will speak from heaven once more. And not only will he shake the earth such that those things that are not his will fall down, but he'll shake the very heavens. I'm not saying we're in those times, but there's a rattling, if not a shaking. And that shaking will set people free if we understand it as coming from the power of God. It says that we're to have grace for one another in response to this, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And the very next verse says, and God is a consuming fire. So let him consume what is not his that those things that are his will remain. And we are his if we believe. We should remain. We should not be shaken. And I believe the powerful individuals that run this world under the power of the wicked one are doing so in fear. I believe they will be held accountable by their father, the devil, if we, the children of the Most High God, don't surrender and finally see ourselves as slaves and prisoners. But, listen to this verse from Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus speaking to one of the seven churches, and he says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. <clears throat> For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Those that serve Satan do so in fear. They may never admit it. They may not even be able to recognize it, but they serve him in fear because if they don't get done what he's asked them to do, they'll be accountable to him. Because if they don't serve the true God of heaven, they serve him, the devil, as their father. And they're working very hard right now to get those that have the only true freedom to act as if we don't. To act as if we are imprisoned. And they're going to work and they're going to continue to work until that comes about, which I don't believe in its totality ever will. And in this verse I read is a promise. Jesus says, I've set a door, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. <coughs> Church, if you think you've been shut in, it's because you have failed to see that you can open the door. Now, you can take that as the door of your house or whatever you'd like, but what I'm telling you is the door of your heart to the things of Christ is a door that can't be shut unless you choose to. That cannot be taken from you. The true freedom you have in Christ, the freedom like can, that can be found nowhere else. It's not one to be surrendered. It's not one to be considered lightly. And it is not one the enemy can take. So they can tell you to shelter in place. But you need to know better in your spirit. Verse 28. But Paul called with a loud voice, 
saying, do not harm, excuse me, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called, called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, you know, our witness to an enslaved world comes as we shine the light of the Lord in the darkness of their prison cells. The light that shines forth in the church is the power released on that resurrection Sunday 2,000 years ago. That power, I remind you again, lives in you, Christian. It lives in you. It's time to release it. Look at verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all those who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Now this takes us full circle to where we started today. What is the gospel message? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We need to engage the great commission and spread that good news, the gospel. Listen, everything that follows this moment and I mean this moment that you're listening to my voice is about how you come to understand your place in the story. And regard that place in the story regardless of your circumstances or the tribulations that you're facing. I have to ask, will you live out your remaining days in re resurrection power or in weakness? Will you howl with the world or will you worship the Lord? Will you shelter in place or walk out the door the Lord has opened that no one can shut? Will you succumb to depression and simply complain? Or will you with joy and thanksgiving say to God, here I am, send me. I'll leave you with this. I have a strong impression and I did all the way through this study that the Lord is telling you to get up and get out of your tomb. Man has put you there, but Jesus is standing there ready to roll away that stone. You just need to believe it, and you need to ask for it, and everything will change from that moment forward, I promise you. So I hope you have a good resurrection day. I hope you're gonna spend it with some people, no matter what the government says. Make it a special day no matter the fact that the church couldn't meet together this time, maybe we will soon. Again, I'm sorry we couldn't be together physically. I know that day is coming soon, whether it's in line with the authorities or because we decided to do it anyway. But we'll be praying towards that day. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. I love you guys. God bless. Father, I just thank you for this time, for your word. Lord, for just the way you instruct us and empower us. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the things that you're asking from our lives, that you didn't just save us that we might sit still. You didn't just save us so that we would do whatever the world says, knowing that heaven is our reward. Lord, you saved us to continue your life on earth, your ministry. And so, Lord, I pray on this special day that you would empower us to do so. And we thank you in advance. And we praise your holy name. All honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.